all addiction has a common root. And that's where you need to go to treat the root. You have to go to the root and find out, hey, what's the deal here? And then take it from there. This is important, talking about addiction, because that is really how to treat it. To go to the root and look at it there and try to deal with it, uh, whatever treatment that calls for. All addictions are this way. Yeah? The process is all the same, whether it's uh, addiction to drugs or an addiction to a process. Because a lot of people don't realize that when people say addiction, that does not mean it's always drugs. It could also mean to a process, to a way of thinking. This could apply to anything. And I'm thinking like, uh, you know, even religion, yeah? You can become addicted to a religion and, you know, some people say, well, of course, I'm addicted to my God because my God is, is God over all and, you know, all that kind of thing. And this doesn't mean it's good because some people are extreme in their religions, in their political ideologies or, or whatever. It is an addiction. And that's not healthy because when people are this way they infuse this thinking into everything they do but the problem is they go extreme so people will go too far and they find a cause that they want to support but they take it too far and they become extreme so they're kind of like like a terrorist in a way. It sounds goofy, but it's true. They are a type of terrorist. And that relates to why they say, when you're talking about the terrorists of today, they'll say extremism, radicalism. Uh, you can apply that same thing to people who only eat food that's fresh and ripe. It's nice to think like that. But when you take it too far, that's the problem. When you start judging others as less than you because they don't do it like you. They don't take it to the same level of extreme that you do. So you say, well, they're not good enough. They're weak. So by those statements alone, you're saying that weakness is not a good thing. And so you're saying, okay, that they don't do it as good as I do, so that means they are not good enough, it means they're weak, so that makes me better. You see that thinking? So they're judgmental of others. So you see how religion fits in here. There's a lot of people who are Christian they really like to judge people. Yeah? For six days of the week, they judge people. And then on this day, they go to church and then act holier than thou. And they only act good to people who are like them. They only act friendly to people who are like themselves. Everybody else, they say, oh, that poor person, just pity him. They don't want to talk to that person because that person's a sinner. And then they're thinking they are better than those who don't go to church. That's something called duality. They see things in only two categories, this and that, themselves and others. And they put themselves up on a pedestal, only associate with each other, and call everybody else bad. Less than, not good enough, pitiful, evil. And then even in church they'll say, let's, let's pray for the people who are 
poor and sick and filthy and sinners. Oh God, please protect them, but keep them away from me and my family, is what they're really saying. And that's duality. See, if you really, really study the life of Christ, now I'm going to sound like a preacher here, but if you really study the life of Christ, I regard him as a teacher. I believe Jesus was a teacher and a healer, but nothing more. One of the things that I like that he teaches is that he says, that which you see me do, you can do it. He tells his apostles, his disciples, his followers, and don't do it for yourself, but do it because they need help. So where did he go? Did he associate with other Christians? Well, there were no Christians back then. Jesus and his followers, they called themselves the saints. It says that in the New Testament. They never called themselves Christians. So when you hear a Christian priest say today, talking about Jesus, the first Christians, Jesus and his followers, that's false. They never called themselves Christians. They call themselves the saints. Which is ironic because there's only one church that calls themselves that today. And it's a church that most other churches despise. They call them a cult. <laughs> yeah. They're treating this church the same way the Judeas treated Jesus and his people. They oppressed them. They didn't want them to exist. These are people who followed the law of Moses. They were always judging Christ. Christ would go to the bad neighborhoods of Jerusalem or wherever he was. And he would look for people that needed help. He would talk with them. He would have dinner with them. And people like prostitutes. He would visit them, not for sex, but to talk with them, to help them, to heal them. He didn't go among the righteous. He even said, you're righteous, so why should I be with you? I can't help you. You're already righteous. I came to help those who need help. That's where I'm going to spend my life. Because these Judea priests, they were really angry that he's this great healer, but he's not hanging around with them. Instead, he's hanging around with prostitutes and other, quote, sinners, unquote. So they start judging Jesus as, as false, just because he wouldn't associate with the righteous. They call Jesus false. False prophet. But what he said makes sense. If you have the ability to heal and to help others, well, why are you not helping those who need your help the most? And those are going to be poor people. And you should never think you're better than anybody. Because when you're a healer, you're a servant. You have no life. Your life belongs to the people. You were called to serve them. You're not called to do seminars and make the people pay. Because you're putting yourself above the people when you do that. That's not what healers do. Healers are servants. They serve the people. They go to where they're needed and they never see themselves as better than others. And they do not do it for attention. As today you see a lot of Christians, they say, well, we're going to Africa and we're going to dig a well for some poor people. And See, they announce it 
to the world. Or even if they did it already, they still announce that they say, yeah, look at what all these wonderful things we did. We did this and we did that. And the reason why they're talking like that is because they want others to put them on a pedestal and admire them. They're not doing it for compassion and generosity. They're doing it to make themselves look good. They're not doing it for the right reason. Look at what I did. And so when they apply for a job, they write that down. See how good I am. I dug a well for poor people in Africa and all did all this and I did all that for poor people. And this is not the purpose of generosity. That's selfishness. And it's vanity. And it's not going to do you any good. Because you did it for the wrong reason. In Lakota Star Knowledge, we have this natural law called Wawokie, which means that whatever you send out, it's going to come back to you four times as strong. That includes how and what you say and how and what you do. And it also includes how you interpret communication that comes to you, whether it's something you see, something you hear, something you taste, something you feel, how do you interpret that? That is also communication. So, doing things just to make yourself look good and then telling everybody about it and putting it on the internet with photos, this is not compassion. This is not generosity. This is selfishness and for some it's narcissism and the energy behind that is unhealthy so when you see Christians announce it to everybody and they say yeah we're going to Africa and we're going to dig a well they're doing this to make themselves look good that's an unhealthy communication. It's not going to hurt the Africans, but it is going to hurt the Christian because they did it for selfishness. And they see themselves as above those that they helped because they believe that it's better to give than to receive. So that means those who receive are less than the giver, the helper. Lakota Star Knowledge says we need to do both. We need to help, but we also need to learn how to accept help. We need to give, but we also need to receive. Just like our lungs. We exhale and we inhale right after each other. If you think it's better to give, that's like exhaling all the time. Try it. It's impossible. It violates nature. And if all you want to do is give, 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 you're going to become a codependent, which means you sink further away from true generosity and deeper inside codependency because you think you're better. This is unhealthy. So when Christ said, do that which you see me do, you can do it too. He meant go to where you're needed and never see yourselves as above them. You see yourself as 
the servant of the people. That's generosity. And you don't announce it. You don't say, look at what I did and all these cool things that I did. That's how cool I am. <laughs> that's selfishness. That is unhealthy. And that's going to come back to you and kick you in the ass. And as I was saying earlier about people who think this way, and they say, if you can't be at the same level as them, then they'll say you're weak. So that means they're saying that weakness is a bad thing. Now they're starting to see themselves as above others. And that the further they live this way, the better they are. This is linear thinking where they only go and think in one direction and that the further they go in that direction, they think they're better. That's linear thinking. And it, it says that everybody behind them is not as good as they are. So that everybody behind them is weak. So they're assigning these labels of good and bad to everything that is not the same as themselves. So they say weakness is bad because of this linear thinking. Lakota Star Knowledge says that weakness is just as important as strength. Again, it's like your lungs. It's like inhaling is a weakness, exhaling is a strength. We need them both to survive. And neither one is good or bad. We need them both. From one we can enjoy it and use it to help others. And the other one can show us things we need to learn. And any time you can learn, that's a good thing. So weaknesses are not bad. That's the Lakota Star Knowledge concept. You need them both. So we need to not only help, but we need to learn how to receive help. We need to not only give, but we need to learn how to receive too. And likewise, strengths are meant for us to help others, and our weaknesses are meant for us to learn from our experiences and from others. It's all healthy when you look at it that way. And it's all necessary. And one more time, if you think that you only should have strengths and that it's better to give, that's like exhaling all the time. It's not possible. It violates nature. And you die you become an oppressor because you're saying you're better than others. As soon as you think in that linear way and you say that everybody who's not at the same level as you is weak, then you're saying you're better. This is oppression. And like I said, this is leading to codependency. That's not generosity. Then you bring in other ideas to support your way of thinking, that you think you're better than others. And then you say, when you live my way, you're always happy. So now you're forcing yourself to only feel the happy emotion. Even when you're not feeling happy, you find something to ignore it or deny whatever it is that's causing you to feel another emotion, you want to stop it, and you do something else, you force yourself to be happy. That's where addiction begins. You see how this fits with duality. What I'm explaining is duality, this saying you're better than others, that your way is the right way, that you're the solution, and if 
others don't agree with you, then you say they're the problem. If you're not with me, then you're against me. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. That's all bullshit. Those are dualistic statements because they only give two options. Lakota Star Knowledge says there's at least three. At least three. In most cases, there's four. Sometimes more. But it's never just two. So people who are thinking that, okay, we only do good things and we only are going to feel the happy emotion. Now they're saying their way is the right way. Anybody else who disagrees with them is wrong, is the enemy. They're saying they're positive and everyone else is negative. So now they're applying these labels of good and bad on positive and negative. So then they say, think only positive and happy thoughts in your life will be good. That's fantasy. That doesn't always work. Tell that to these girls that are born into extreme Muslim households where once they reach a certain age, they have their clitorises cut off. Some of these girls die in that operation. Tell that to them. Think positive and happy thoughts and everything will, will be good. It doesn't work. Look these people who are born into populations that are starving. Tell that to them. Are you going to sit there and say, they deserve that? A baby deserves that? That's oppression. Simply so you're saying you're positive. You're saying that's the good thing. This is unrealistic thinking. Lakota Star Knowledge says positive is not about being good. Negative is not about being bad because there is no good versus evil. And that the universe is made up of more than just positive and negative. There's neutrality. And then there's other things too. It's not just positive and negative. There's more to it. The universe needs all of that to exist. So if you just focus on positive, and that really could happen, the universe will cease to exist. Thinking positive Happy thoughts leads to addiction and something called duality because you're saying you're better than others who are not like you. You're calling yourself good and everybody else who's not like you is evil. They're not good enough, so they must be bad. So you see everything like this, and that's why these kind of people judge everybody. Because they put themselves up on the pedestal. They feel they have the right to judge others who are not like them. That's the road to narcissism. That's the road to codependency. It's all unhealthy living to think in just this and that. But Kota Star Knowledge says there's this, that, and the other. And it's not about what's right and what's wrong. It's about what can we learn? In dualistic people who only see good and bad and they focus only on the emotion of happiness, they see consequences of their choices that did not work. They see that as bad, as a mistake. Lakota Star Knowledge says, no, if you learn from it and make the most of it and release the emotion in a constructive way, you're going to gain knowledge and wisdom and peace. 
So you've transformed it into a teacher, a learning experience. And remember what I said, anytime you can learn, it's not bad. So we don't see it as a mistake. We see it as a learning experience. When you do it, when you learn, when you make the best, when you release the emotion that come with that experience in a constructive way, it's going to take you to a really nice place. And you're going to have lots of knowledge that you can use and wisdom to help others. So you're learning to live so you can love. That's the Lakota Star Knowledge Way. There's always at least three perspectives to everything. So difficulty is not a mistake. But when you neglect it and you say, no, I'm never doing that again, shit, fuck that. And you go do something else. You just missed an opportunity to learn something. You just missed an opportunity to increase the peace and health in your life. So you're the one who makes it a mistake. The consequence is not a mistake until you neglect it. And when you neglect it, you are putting obstacles in your own path. You're making your life more difficult than necessary. And you're the one who's doing it. So you may think, yeah, I made a mistake and hell with it. Not doing that again. But you don't learn. And you think you're righteous for that. and You're actually putting stumbling blocks, other obstacles into your own life path. The more you live in this dualistic way of good versus evil, the more you are losing sight of reality. And you're starting to become closed-minded. Because you're so judgmental of everybody who's not like you, who doesn't agree with you. That's duality. It's not healthy. This is where addiction is created. It begins in the mind. And as a result, when we are living in circumstances that lead us to low self-esteem, Whatever it is, whether it's bad parenting or whatever, we look for something to cover the pain so that we won't think about it. And that's where the substance addictions begin. But it all begins in the mind. What happens? There's some addictions, they're so powerful that some people might come from a nice home and everything, but they'll say, I want to try this once to see what it's like. And unfortunately, some of these drugs are so strong that it only takes you one time and you're addicted to it already. But you see, it's the thinking behind it first. Why did you want to try it once? So it's important to learn about duality. That's the root. It's so important to know what that is. Because if you try to destroy duality, you become dualistic. <laughs> yeah? As you try to destroy it, it becomes you. You become it. So that's not the way to deal with it. The way to deal with it is to learn how it works. You treat it as a difficulty. You learn how it works so you can transform it into something healthy that will work, that will help others. So we don't see duality as a bad thing because that would be dualistic. Yeah, We see it as something that's incomplete, that needs to be completed. And you do that by learning from it. And sometimes it's going to boil down to well, learning how not to do something. And that's really important. 
A lot of us get educations and we learn how to do this and how to do that. But that's not the full picture of learning. The other side is learning how not to do something. That's just as important. So you have to really examine yourself and say, am I thinking like that? Good and evil. Because that's the beginning of duality. So when Christ was hanging around with the prostitutes, the alcoholics and the drug addicts, he was there to help them. And he was not there to say, see, look at how wonderful I am. I'm helping these people. He wasn't doing that. He wasn't broadcasting, look at what I'm doing. He wasn't doing that. He just went there and helped them. They needed help. So he went there. He had the means to help them. So he went there to help them. He didn't care who you were. But remember, in true generosity, that also means to know when to say no. Because sometimes people want something that they think it's going to help them, but it really it isn't. So you have to say no. Because if you say yes, you become an enabler. And that's codependency, which is part of addiction, which is duality. So saying yes all the time, that doesn't mean you're good. It means you're, you're sick. I'll say it again. True generosity includes knowing when to say no. And saying yes all the time leads to codependency. That's not generosity. These are the differences. So look at the world today. Look at all the things that fit the dualistic platform. Look at all the things that fit in that. Religion, political ideologies, economic ideologies, focusing only on the physical body. That's how society is today. They only focus on one part. Lakota Star Knowledge says there's four parts to the self. The physical, the mental, the spiritual, and the emotional. And all four parts are important because they all connect to each other. If one part goes down, eventually the others are going to go down. If you focus only on one part, it makes the other three weak, and then the fourth part is going to become addicted. Addictive. And that's duality. Self-oppression. Then you oppress others. Oppression begins within an unhealthy, dualistic individual. Because they're first, they're oppressing themselves because they do not see the fullness of reality. Remember what I said earlier, in duality, you do not see the fullness of reality. You become closed-minded. So, with your limited vision, you judge others who are not like you as less than you. A lot of bodybuilders are this way. A lot of scientists are this way. A lot of psychologists are this way. They see themselves as above others because they're only focusing on one part of the self. A lot of priests see themselves this way. This is setting up attention. It's setting up a stress. Because in dualistic thinking, they say, okay, if that's bad, that means we're not supposed to do it. But in that process, it creates temptation. And then they want to do it secretly. The next thing you know, priests are molesting children. 
people who are focused on physical health start becoming into health disorders, which can include eating disorders. Usually those things come from other things, but it can play a role. It leads to unhealthy lifestyle. So you see they're oppressing themselves first, and then they oppress others because they don't realize it, but they're following a Lakota Star Knowledge concept. That Lakota Star Knowledge concept is reality begins within. So however you're communicating to others, you're doing the same thing to yourself. That's because reality begins with him. So because of that concept, we do our best in our way to learn to take care of ourselves physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally so that we learn from our difficulties to enjoy our blessings, communicate in a healthy way, receive communication in a healthy way. That means interpret things in a clear way expressing our emotions in a constructive way to learn so that we can live, so that we can love. This is our way. It has no good versus evil and anything that creates it. Anything that is related to good versus evil does not fit in the Lakota Star Knowledge concept because it's not healthy. Anything that doesn't fit Lakota Star knowledge leads to unhealthiness, and it's dualistic. But remember, we don't see that as bad. We see the duality in a learning way. We need to learn how it works, so that when we encounter it, we know how to deal with it in a healthy way, where it doesn't do anything. It can't. Where it loses power. So we're not destroying duality, but we're transforming it into something healthy. Even if it's just learning how not to do something, that's still important. Because reality begins within. This is the reason why we do that. To live this way. Because reality begins within. So when we live in this way, we're building a healthy inside, a healthy within ourselves. We're making it healthy. We're building it. And that process includes we're creating peace inside of ourselves and we're also creating intimacy. Now we have something to share with others. So this is the only way you'll know love. This is the only way you will know what love is. So people who are dualistic, they don't really know what love is. What they do know is a false idea, and it's an addiction to a concept, an unhealthy concept of what they think love is. In duality, people will say, I need somebody to complete me. I'm looking for my better half. They don't realize it, but it shows you they're incomplete. And this is not healthy. This is dualistic. It's showing a dependency. Lakota Star Knowledge says we were not designed to be alone. We were designed to be with somebody. But we need to be 100%, each of us, first. Because when you are 100%, That means you know how to learn from difficulties. That you do not believe in good versus evil. That you believe that duality can be transformed into something that can be healthy. That all emotions are important. And that some are part of learning experiences. So they must be released in a constructive way. That others are meant to be enjoyed, and that we do not dwell in the emotion, but that it's a part of an experience, whether it's a learning experience or a blessing experience. 
that weaknesses are just as important as strengths. These are important to know. When you know these things, and that means you're learning from difficulties too. As I said, when you do learn from difficulties, that includes making the best of it and expressing the emotions in a constructive way. You receive knowledge, wisdom, peace. These are blessings. And you help others with that. This is how you are 100%. Now comes the second concept of Lakota Star Knowledge. Like attracts like. How you are is what you attract. So when you're living this healthy way, you attract somebody healthy. So you're 100%. That means you're going to attract somebody who is also 100%. When you enter a relationship with this person, the relationship is a new entity. It's an extension of each of you coming together, forming a new entity where you still are 100% and your partner is still 100%, but this new dimension, this new entity that has a part of each of you is also 100%. This new dimension that includes both of you is another 100%. So that's why in Lakota Star Knowledge, when it comes to love, the equation is 100% plus 100% equals 100%. You're 100%. Your partner is 100%. What you create together is another 100%. Your relationship is an extension of each of you together. But it's such that you're still 100% individual. Your partner is still 100% individual. But both of you have created a third 100% that includes both of you. See how that works? It's wonderful. So you're not completing each other. You don't need to depend on each other for happiness. You already have it. Each of you already has it. So what you're creating is a new dimension. Your relationship is a new dimension. That's love. Love is not about dependency. Love is freedom. Freedom to be yourself and freedom to be with each other. It includes both. That's what this equation means. 100% plus 100% equals 100%. That's love mathematics. (laughs) Makes perfect sense. (laughs) But you see, in duality, it's 50% plus 50% equals 100%. And in love, That's not good. In math, it's okay, but in love, nope, it's not good. Because it's codependency. It's duality. It's addiction. That's unhealthiness. And when you look around this modern world today, you see it everywhere. Presenting false and unhealthy ideas of love. So you hear all these love songs. I am nothing without you. I need you to live. You're my better half. See, this is all unhealthy views. These are projections of unhealthy thinking. Dualistic thinking. That's never going to work. That's going to lead to an oppressor-victim relationship. That's duality. Even society is this way. You have countries constantly oppressing each other. That's duality. So, this is important to learn, to know what duality is. Lakota Star Knowledge was the foundation of our ancestral way. 
Lakota Star knowledge, which is how we were living for thousands of years. And then something happened. Changed everything. Today's Indians no longer think like this. Now we're dualistic too. How did that happen? How did we change? See, people who don't know our history, they see us as living in teepees on the prairie, and now we're all powwow dancers and flute players today. <laughs> That's really an incomplete picture. There's a bunch of pieces of the puzzle missing. And that's why I want to explain what are the missing pieces. Because what most people see today about Indian spirituality is very, very incomplete. And that what Indians are living is not healthy. We are not following our ancestral ways anymore. What we're following is a dualistic version of it because we don't have all the pieces anymore. How did this happen? What caused us to lose very important pieces from our ancestors to the point where now we're dualistic? Now we believe in good versus evil. Today, Indians say, we smudge ourselves to get rid of the bad energies. That's a duality. Our ancestors say we smudge ourselves to bring peace to the area, to neutralize unsteady, unhealthy anything. Not to destroy, but to neutralize. See the difference? Our ancestors talked about neutralizing the area, neutralizing ourselves so that we become open to inspiration, messages, learning. But today's Indians say we smudge to protect ourselves from bad energy. It's not the same. Today, we're dualistic. We're not like our ancestors. Even when we're doing ceremonies, there's still duality in the ceremonies today. We're putting it there. How did this happen? People don't realize that we changed drastically from our ancestors' way of thinking. People don't realize this. Even Indians don't realize this. How did this happen? I'll explain how that happened. Because it's very important to know. Because it's part of our history. And for us to return to the level of our ancestors, we've got to know what happened. So we can mend it. So that we can mend the sacred hoop. There's something missing. There is something missing. And I'm going to tell you what happened to cause that. It's not the white man. A lot of people want to say, oh, it's the white man. No, because the same thing happened to them too. It happened to people all over the world. What I'm going to talk about, this process happened to people all over the world. This is not a white man thing. No, today it's an Indian thing too, and it's not healthy. Back in the late 1800s, when we were placed on reservations, there were prison camps in the beginning. And uh, this is a situation where we couldn't leave. We were not allowed to hunt. Our knives and guns were taken from us. And we were only allowed to eat whatever the American government gave to us, which was really no good food. The quality of the food was okay when it left places like Chicago and stuff like that. But once it got to some of these train stations between there and the reservation, a lot of these handlers would sell it. And then they would buy old food and put that in there instead. And these middlemen would make 
A lot of money. So what we got on the reservation was bullshit food. It was really no good. And we ended up getting all kinds of diseases like uh, heart diseases, hypertension, diabetes, things like that. And then at the same time, our language and ceremonies were declared illegal by the United States. So we were hit physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Soon after that, our minds became weak. These are the four parts of the South. So with the four parts of the South being sick, we lost our connection to our sacred center. So we started to focus on communicating away from that. And then the priests came from the various churches, and they learned our ways and said that since our ways conflict with the Bible, that our ways are evil, that they come from Satan. They come from the devil. So in our weakened states, we slowly began to accept that. Now, another thing is that there were some Lakota people that didn't want to accept that. They wanted to hang on to the traditional Lakota star knowledge ways. And if they revolted, they were sent to a mental hospital in Canton, South Dakota, which was set up for all reluctant Indians in America that did not want to become Christianized. They were sent there. And these church priests also committed the medicine men, medicine women, holy men, holy women, they committed all of them to these mental asylums too. This way, the people would not go to them for help, that they would come to the churches. They wanted the Indian people to only go to the priests and not their traditional healers. So they sent the healers to this mental asylum to die. And if you are radical, you were sent there to die too. So while this is happening, the priests are saying to Indian people, if you believe our way, we will help your children. And so it was a very, very dire straits time. And so a lot of Indians became Christians because of that. Like I said, we were weak-minded too at that point. And those who stuck it out, there were people who refused to accept Christianity, but they went to church anyway. What they were doing was they were putting up a candy store front. On the outside, they were acting like good little Christian Indians, but on the inside they weren't. They were star knowledge people. They did this because they didn't want to get sent to that mental asylum to die. That's sad, isn't it? But that's part of what happened back then. And it's because of these people who maintained this knowledge in secret. Thanks to them, they passed it down to certain people, like me. And we still have this knowledge and I'm sharing it with you because this regards the sacred center and we all have that this is not a Lakota thing this is a Ikche Oyate thing Ikche Oyate means human being when you live this way you communicate as a human not as a Lakota not as a German or a Japanese or an African you communicate as a human. That's really important to know. So, that's how it was back then. Now, remember I said that the, the priest said to the Indians, we will help your children. So, they took the children away from the parents, sent them to boarding school hundreds of miles away, where these children were tortured to speak only English, and learn a civilized Christian way. If they spoke about home, they were tortured. These schools didn't do background checks in those days. The pay was really low. So they got really no good teachers in these schools. A lot of these teachers were sadistic. 
they got sexual pleasure from torturing people. And here, this is like summer holiday camp for them. And the same thing for perverts. A lot of perverts now have their pick of the litter. And they could get away with it. That's what happened. A lot of these children were murdered. They were killed. They were raped. They were molested. And there's a lot of unmarked graves near these schools. Not all of these children are accounted for. So, those who made it through, what they learned was whatever they saw. Because a lot of these children never went back home. They were told by the priests that their families had died. And that there was nobody there. And that broke their hearts. This is why some of these children, they were so sad, they couldn't eat. And they ended up starving themselves to death. And those who made it through, like I said, they didn't really survive because they were not able to process all these emotional traumas that they experienced. They didn't know how. Because the only adults that were around them were these unhealthy, abusive people, teachers, dorm matrons, cooks, janitors, priests. They were all unhealthy to them. That's all they knew. They learned how to become victims, and they learned how to become abusers to those who they considered weaker than themselves. So they didn't really survive. A lot of these children that made it through these schools, they had a lot of traumas that they didn't know how to deal with because all they saw was abuse. That's what they learned. They had, there was no adult healthy role models to emulate. I remember I said these children were told that their families were all dead, so they didn't go back during summer holiday. They just stayed at these schools and worked. So when they left these schools, they tried to live in mainstream America. Nobody accepted them. They would say, ah, you're a heathen. You're a dirty Indian. So they couldn't even get jobs off the reservation. And when they went back to the reservation, to their people they ran into more problems. Many, many times they were not even accepted by their own people because their own people were saying, oh, you're too white. You act like a white man. So they're caught in between. So a lot of them turned to alcohol to try to hide all of it, to try to forget everything. They turned to alcohol and then later drugs. There were some who tried to make it. They married each other because they knew each other went through the same thing. And they didn't want their children to go through what they went through. So they didn't teach them the language. They didn't teach them the culture. Those children, the children of these first generation boarding school people, those children are today's elders. When they were born, they didn't learn the language. They didn't learn Lakota Star knowledge. They never got the opportunity to. When you look at an old person on the reservation today, they're not the connection to the ancient past. No, they were born in a Christian background. At a time when the reservations were strongly Christian. So this is what happened. That's a native experience that a lot of people don't realize. This is, this is what happened all over America and Canada too. So the next generation, they are sent to boarding school too. No choice. It's a little bit better, but they're still abused. They're still getting treated really no good. And so they grow up have children and they don't 
teach their children anything. What, what can they teach them? They don't know anything concerning their own language. This is why today most people cannot speak their own language. And what little cultural information they know is Christianized. Meaning, it's dualistic. And it's not the original ancient form. Okay, so the first generation of Indian kids that were sent to boarding school, since all around them were unhealthy adults who did nothing but abuse them, they didn't receive healthy parenting. They missed things that they should have learned about life. So they're lacking emotional development. So when they grow up, and those who make it through these boarding schools, and then they, they have children, those children are also lacking that emotional support, that emotional development. Because the parents don't know how to do it. All they knew and all they learned was abuse. All they experienced in these schools was abuse. So they have a hard time trying to be a healthy parent. So they do the best that they can. But the children still are not receiving the proper emotional development, the, the experiences that, that healthy children should receive from healthy parents. They're still missing that. And so when that second generation grows up, they know even less concerning healthy parenting. And so their children receive even less. And every time this happens, the next generation becomes more dualistic than the previous one. So let me try to say that again. The first generation boarding school kids, they didn't receive proper parenting skills. So when they have children, their children are not receiving healthy training that they should be receiving. They're receiving even less than their parents. Now that second generation, when they grow up, see, they know even less. So when they have children, those children are, are receiving even less, and it gets worse with each generation, which also means that the less healthy emotional development they receive, the more dualistic they become. So with each generation is more becoming emotionally underdeveloped, they're also becoming more dualistic. So today, it's a huge mess on the reservation. As a whole, we're incredibly underdeveloped emotionally, and we are incredibly dualistic. We're quick to attack each other. We're quick to pull each other down. We're just like the rest of the civilized, dualistic world. Notice I didn't say white man, because this is all over the world. It's not just among white countries. It's all over the world. Wherever there is a dualistic ideology, where one gender is considered less than and property of the other gender, you're going to have incredibly underdeveloped emotional people, which equals incredibly dualistic people. And that is unhealthy. So that started by the time of the late 1800s on the reservation. To learn more about Lakota spirituality, I have written a book called Wichokhan Otehike. This book also includes Lakota star knowledge information. All the videos that I make, which are about Lakota spirituality, Lakota star knowledge, and cultural information, are based on this book. This book costs 99 American dollars, and this price includes the shipping cost 
as well as a tracking number. And to learn more about Lakota language, I have written a Lakota language book called Chante et Tanhan Owoglake, Speaking from the Heart. And all my Lakota language videos are based on this book. This book cost 119 American dollars, and this price includes the shipping cost as well as a tracking number. I also teach online and I give spiritual consultations as well. The price for these sessions are 35 American dollars an hour. If you are interested in any of my services and products, you can send payment via PayPal to my email address, which is hechaka7 at yahoo.com. That's H-E-H-A-K-A, -A, the number 7, at yahoo.com. And also include your shipping address and your email address when you send your payment. Ha, oh, Lila Pilamaelo. Thank you very much.